we've sung some songs this morning about how great God is and how loving he is. And yet, it's unfair for a father and a mother to lose their son. It's unfair for a wife to lose her husband, for children to lose their dad. It's unfair. And so what I want to do this morning is I want to share a message to bring these truths together. That we do have a good God and that life is unfair. So let's pray and then I'm going to share a message with you. Let's pray. Lord, we just want to ask you to speak this morning as we read from your word and as we um, explore what your word has to say about this life. Lord, you're a good God and this life is hard. And we just ask that you would speak to us this morning and bring comfort through the words that are in your word, in Jesus' name. Amen. One of my favorite shows, one of my favorite family shows, is a show called Malcolm in the Middle. And the reason I love this show is because it's a hilarious family comedy about an ordinary family who just do ordinary things, and so many things in their life goes wrong. But they do it together, because <laughs> that's what it means to be in a family. And the reason I bring this show up this morning in the context of this message is the theme song of the show ends with saying, life is unfair. And it's just very true. And one of the reasons I, this show is such an encouragement to me is because it presents the reality of this world in, in such a friendly way. But it's a song that suits the show and it's also a song that suits life. Life is unfair. You know, when we are young, we have so many aspirations about what we can be in life, don't we? I mean, maybe be an astronaut or an actor or a, or a big, powerful lawyer or something like that. And those of us who are parents here this morning, we have even greater aspirations for our children, don't we? And our grandchildren. Because we know, we know that they can be greater than we are if they just apply themselves because they have so much potential and there's so many things we can offer them that we've already learned on their behalf. Parents have aspirations for who they want their children to be. We have aspirations for who we want to be. Many are the dreams we have. And many are the ways in which this world crushes our dreams. And I know this is not a nice thing to talk about this morning, uh, not the nicest thing to hear, but the truth is life is unfair. And this world, it has beauty, it has glamour, it has so many amazing things in it, but it also has a brutal cruelty that we have to face all too often. It's this unfairness in life that can cause people to think, well, how can there be a good God? How can there be a God who loves us? It can cause people to really doubt that there is a God who does love us. Have you ever wrestled with this? Have you ever wrestled with this idea? How can there be a good God that loves us in a world like this? I know I have. In fact, I know many people have. But did you know that the Bible itself wrestles with this question? The Bible itself. So what I want to do this morning is show you a book which talks about this. And it's a powerful little book called Ecclesiastes. And it starts off with a very simple point. Life is vanity. <laughs> Life is meaningless. Now, I have a really good friend of mine who once said to me when he first read this book, he said, Matt, why is this book in the Bible? It's so depressing. When he started reading it, he's like, why is this book in the Bible? But I think this is one of the most powerful books in the Bible for giving us a perspective about the toils and the struggles we face in life. It says in Ecclesiastes 1, verse 1 to 9, the words of the preacher... The son of David, king in Jerusalem. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What does man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? A generation goes and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun goes down and hastens to the place where it rises. The wind blows to the south and goes around to the north. Around and around goes the wind. And on its circuit the wind returns. All streams return to the sea, but the sea is not full. To the place where the, sun, where the streams flow, there they flow again. All things are full of weariness, and man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. What has been 
is what will be, and what has been done is what will be done, and there is nothing new under the sun. You know, I love the way that this book starts with the words of the preacher. And you think that he's going to give this grand inspirational message after it says that. And then what does he say? Vanity of vanities. All is vanity. Another translation puts it this way. Meaningless, meaningless. All is meaningless. And, wow, what a, a bummer of a way to start a book of the Bible. But let's meditate on these words for a moment. Everything is vanity. Everything is meaningless. Why would Solomon, a great teacher of the Lord, write these words in the Bible? Which is a book which is supposed to be teaching us the meaning of life, right? Why would he say these things? Well, let's meditate on what life is like. What does man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? A generation goes and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun goes down and hastens to the place where it rises. The wind blows to the south and the round goes around to the north and around and around goes the wind and on its circuit the wind returns. If you just look at the earth itself and the inhabitants of it, you see all of this action and all of this busyness and very little meaningfulness, don't you? What does man gain for his toil? Things. And what does he do with those things? Uses them to get other things. What's the meaning in that? You know, so many people work and work and work and just work and come to an end where if you ask them why, they might just say, well, what else is there to do? That's what you do in life. You study at school to get good grades, to go to university and you, or, or to get a trade or to get some kind of certificate. And then you work hard at that so you can get the career that you want or the career that you didn't want. <laughs> and then you work hard at that to save money. And then you retire. And then you wait to die. And not even everyone gets those chances. Where is the meaningfulness in all of this? It's just busyness, activity. Where is the heart-driven sense of meaning that we really need? Generations come and generations go, and basically the world stays the same. The days pass, the sun rises and sets, the weather follows its cycles. From a pure human perspective, there does not appear to be meaning in just what we see in this world. So what did this teacher do? What did Solomon, the writer of Ecclesiastes, want to do? Well, he sought to investigate and look into the world and seek to find meaning in the world. And let's look at what he found. First, he starts where we would expect any wise men to start. He seeks to find meaning in wisdom. Ecclesiastes 1 verse 12 to 14, I, the preacher, have been king over Israel and Jerusalem, and I applied my heart to seek and to search out by wisdom all that is done under heaven. It is an unhappy business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. I have seen everything that is done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity and a striving after the wind. What does he do? He sets himself to observation. Before there was science... There was observation. People just, to learn things, the only way they really could do it was just to observe, look, and make notes and study how things worked. This is how they gathered wisdom. This is how they gathered knowledge. But all he found in his quest for knowledge and wisdom was a deeper understanding of the futility of this life. The more he gained knowledge, the more he just understood that futility better. <laughs> but it didn't take it away. In fact, if all you do is set to observe how this wor world works and the things people endure, this doesn't give you meaning. If that's all you do. All it does is give you a, a deeper understanding of how unfair this life is because so much in this life does seem unfair, is unfair, and seems meaningless. Gaining knowledge just gives you a deeper understanding of the unfairness of life. So where does he turn next? Well, he turns to where I think most of us would think you should turn if you want to find meaning, in pleasure, in things that you enjoy doing. Surely, if you cannot find meaning in books and degrees and studies and, and wisdom, surely you can find meaning in pleasure. Well, let's see what he says. I said in my heart, come now, I will test you with pleasure, enjoy yourself, but behold, this also was vanity. I said of my laughter, it is mad, and of pleasure, what use is it? 
I search with my heart to cheer my body with wine, my heart still guiding me with wisdom, and how to lay hold on folly, till I may see what was good for the children of man to do unto heaven during the few days of their life. Trying to find pleasure in this, find meaning in pleasure in this world is the quest of many. You could call this the Charlie Sheen quest for meaning. And many find that they don't find meaning in this. We all know that whatever pleasure we turn our minds to, whatever it is, whatever you love to do, just think of what you love to do, whatever it is you turn your minds to, what happens if you do it too much? It loses its gloss. It loses its sheen. If you play too much, then play becomes a bore. If we focus too much on the pleasures of this world, then those pleasures become the things that we need to get escape from and find diversion from. How many people find on their holidays, I can't wait, get, wait to get back to work, which you regret just after three days getting back after the holidays? Because we cannot find pleasure in meaning. No matter, oh, sorry, we cannot find meaning in pleasure. No matter what we seek to find pleasure in, our mind will turn it to boredom eventually. And if you think I'm wrong, well, let's listen to the words of a man who engaged in more pleasures than most of us will ever be able to experience because of his great wealth and power. Look at all the things that Solomon says he did. I made great works. You know, he made amazing things. He built incredible buildings. He built the temple of the Lord. He built a, a palace. I built ha houses and planted vineyards for myself. I made myself gardens and parks and planted in them all kinds of fruits and trees. I made myself pools from which to water the forest of growing trees. I brought male and female slaves and had slaves who were born in my house. I also had great possessions of herds and flocks, more than any who had been before me in Jerusalem. I also gathered from our silver and gold and the treasure of kings and provinces. I got singers, both men and women, and many concubines, the delights of the Son of Man. So I became great and surpassed all who were with, before me in Jerusalem. Also, my wisdom remained with me. You know, if you think you can find meaning in pleasure... Do you think you can out, outdo Solomon in the things that he sought to find it in and yet did not find it? Most of us will never come even close to the kind of wealth that he had and the ability to seek after pleasures, even pleasures that we think a man should not have. Now, all of the things that we seek, all of the things that we seek for meaning and pleasure eventually fade. Meaning is not found in pleasure. So then he thinks, well, what about in foolishness? Perhaps... Meaning is found in foolishness. So I turn to consider wisdom and madness and folly. For what can the man do who comes after the king? Only what has already been done. Then I saw that there is more gain in wisdom than in folly, as there is more gain in light than in darkness. The wise person has his eyes in his head, but the fool walks in darkness. And yet I perceive that the same event happens to all of them. Then I said in my heart, what happens to the fool will happen to me also. Why then have I been very wise? And I said in my heart that this is also vanity. You know, wisdom is better than folly. Of course it's better. But no matter how much you work to be wise, the same fate of the fool will overtake all those who are wise. We all die. So where does he end up back again? Back at work. I hated all my toil in which I toil and I said, that I must leave it to the man who will come after me. And who knows whether he will be wise or a fool. And he will be a master of all for which I have told and used my wisdom under the sun. This also is vanity. So I turned about and gave my heart up to despair over all the toil of my labors in the sun. Because sometimes a person who is toiled with wisdom and knowledge and skill must leave everything to be enjoyed by someone who did not toil for it. This also is a vanity and a great evil. You know, we work all our lives, all of our lives, to gather to ourselves things. Nice things, things that we like. I like books. I've gathered a lot of books. <laughs> we all gather things. And we seek to preserve them. And then we all end up, all of us, end up having to leave them to someone else who didn't work for them. This life is not fair. Ecclesiastes is like a gut punch of truth to the heart. That the hard reality of this life is that it is not fair. And from the human perspective, if you just look at the human perspective, it also appears to be meaningless. Except it isn't. 
It just appears to be if you don't look in the right direction, if you only allow your observations to go so far. See, what Ecclesiastes, what Solomon is trying to tell us with this book is not that life is meaningless, is that life is meaningless if you approach it wrong. Because what we need is eternal satisfaction. You see, all of our desires in this life, all of our natural desires, have a natural fulfillment. Our desire for pleasure can be fulfilled in pleasurable things for a time. Our desire for food can be fulfilled by eating. Our desire for sex can be filled, fulfilled. Our desire for busyness can be fulfilled in our work. All of our temporal desires can be filled by temporal things, natural things in this life. But we have another desire, one that won't go away. We have a desire for eternal satisfaction. And there is nothing in this natural life that can fulfill it. Nothing in this natural world that can fully satisfy it. And even the Rolling Stones complained about that, right? They can't get no satisfaction. And they were wealthy and famous and popular. Now, if we evolved from some microorganism in a purely natural world with only natural things to guide our formation to what we are today, then shouldn't we be able to find satisfaction in the things from which we evolved and which shaped our evolution? Shouldn't we? But we can't. Why? Because we didn't come from those things and we're not for those things. Because we were created for a satisfaction that is outside of this world, that is eternal. And that is the only thing which can give us the greater fulfillment we need. See, we should be able to be fulfilled by the natural things of this world if we are just a natural product of this world. But look what he says in Ecclesiastes 1 verse 8. All things are full of weariness. A man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear with, filled with hearing, or the stomach with eating, or the body with sleeping. <laughs> None of the things in this world can satisfy us because we were not created to find satisfaction in the things of this world. See, if we were created for an eternal satisfaction, an eternal purpose, by an eternal being, to find our eternal satisfaction with that eternal being, then our longing for eternal satisfaction is not only reasonable, it makes sense. Because it's telling us there's something outside of this world that we need. And that's exactly what Ecclesiastes tells us. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity into man's heart. We have an a desire for eternal satisfaction because we were created to seek after it and seek the only one who can offer it, and that is the Lord. See, God made you to, made you to need to know that you need to seek satisfaction outside of the things of this world. God made the things of this earth for us to enjoy. He gave them as good gifts to us, and they are wonderful gifts, the things that he gives us in this world, Right? But he didn't make them to fully satisfy us. He, made the, he gave them to remind us of the good God who gives them to us. And the conclusion of this little book is really simple. Remember also your creator in the days of your youth before the evil days come and the years draw near of which you will say, I have no pleasure in them. What's he saying? Remember God before all your joy and all the things of this world runs out and you can no longer find your fulfillment in them which will come. The end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God and his commandments and keep his commandments for this is the whole duty of man or the whole purpose of man, you could say. For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. Remember that you were created by God for God to find your satisfaction in God. And remember this before it is too late. The point of Ecclesiastes is that, yes, life is unfair, but it is not meaningless, it is not vanity, if you know where true meaning lies. In the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. In the Lord who made you to know him. Now, some people would say to this, yeah, okay, but 
this world is filled with so much suffering and so much pain, and this is just unfair, which we've been talking about this morning, but this suffering really causes people to trip up on the idea of a loving God. And yes, there is suffering in this life, but the scriptures teach us that suffering comes in because of the sinfulness of humanity. But get this. This is really important to understand. God knows that this life is hard. And God knows that there is suffering in this life. And God knows that there are things in this life which are not fair. And you know what his response to that was? His response to that was to become a little child, born of a virgin, to grow up and to become a man who lived in this world, who experienced the unfairness of this world, who had to work for a living and struggle in, 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 in a small province in the Roman Empire. And he was an innocent man, a good man. In fact, no one who ever met him could ever accuse him of any wrong. And then you know what happened to this, this good man, this innocent man? He was murdered. He was murdered by powerful people. I mean, if you want to talk about unfair, that is the most unfair thing that you can ever conceive of, is it not? Someone being executed for a crime they never committed. Someone being harmed by the powerful because he was good. So not only does he know that this life is unfair, he experienced the unfairness of this life on our behalf. Why? So that he could die on that cross to take the punishment for the sins that we deserve. Every secret thing, whether good or evil, we will face an account of. And he took that punishment on our behalf because he loves us. So yes, life is unfair, but we do have a good God, a loving God. And he calls out to you this morning to trust in him and to trust in him before it is too late. He experienced the suffering. He experienced the unfairness in a way that is probably even more extreme than any of us will ever experience. You know, Luke and his family reached out to me to come and visit him in hospital and to share with him the word of God and to make sure that he was right with the Lord before he passed from this life, before his life ended. And I went to hospital to seek to do that with him. And there is a great tragedy in the loss of his life. There is a great tragedy You know, death was never meant to be a part of this world. And it sucks. But there is also an element of hope in this. Because, and mercy, because in his passing, you've all been here this morning to come and to celebrate his life and to mourn his loss, but you've also got to hear the message that Luke wanted to hear and the message that his family wants you to hear and that they wanted to hear. And that is very simple, and it is this. Trust in the Lord before it's your time. Trust in the Lord before it is your time. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your gospel. And we thank you that you experience the unfairness of this life on our behalf. And Lord, we just pray that as we sing this final song this morning, and bring this service to a close. That you would just continue to comfort the family and help us to be a comfort to this family. And Lord, that you would turn people's hearts to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm